And speaking of advocacy, um, you know, we have with us today uh, Rick Willis, uh, who is the uh, uh, president and CEO of the Brain Injury Association of America. And uh, this is a small but growing and mighty uh, group here uh, that we really need as part of our whole um, uh, team, if you will, to help us. It can't just be physicians. It can't just be physician researchers. Uh, as I said, the patients have a hard time speaking for themselves. And so we need folks like Rick who are out there representing patients and their families to do the advocacy that we need uh, to garner the resources to help move things along. So with that, I'll turn this over to uh, Rick. Great. Thank you, Jeff and uh, Tina. <clears throat> Great to hear from both of you. And I think as I go to share my screen here, because I do have a few slides that I wanted uh, to go through, I think you're going to hear uh, a number of common themes in what I review and discuss and what you heard from uh, from Jeff and Tina. We, we definitely do need an aware community, a concussion aware community, a brain injury aware community. And this is an unfunded national epidemic. And if you're uh, not convinced already from what you've heard um, so far today, I'm hoping to actually paint a picture for you with some of the faces and you, you've you heard, and some of the voices, and you've, you've heard that term used um, already. And if you're not familiar with the Brain Injury Association of America, I wanted just to let you know that there's a number of things that, that we are focused on. So when we say that we're the voice of brain injury, in the brain injury community, uh, what we mean by that is we're focused on prevention, making more people aware of what brain injury is, such as what we're doing here today, and hopefully uh, preventing more, uh, more brain injuries. But we also fund research, elevating best practices and treatment, uh, making sure that we're elevating education about brain injury and among uh, both survivors, caregivers, uh, and professional, and of course, advocacy and policy work and bringing again uh, voice and elevating voice and amplifying voice for those who can't speak for themselves. We're also the nation's largest network when it comes to brain injury. So we have a network of state-based affiliates all across the country. And we are the place where people who have uh, care for or treat someone uh, with a brain injury turn for connections and resources uh, and community and expert guidance. And in fact, you may not know that uh, at the Brain Injury Association of America, we field more than 20,000 individuals a year who turn to us for those supports. And it's people like someone that I want to introduce you to named Bethany. Uh, Bethany reached out to our organization. Um, she is a caregiver uh, for her father who suffered a traumatic brain injury. And I hope that you will indulge me because I actually want to read her email to you uh, in its entirety. It'll take me 20 or 30 seconds here to get through. But uh, I hope you'll see the point for why when I get through this. She wrote to us and said, hello, my name's Bethany. I'm a caregiver and medical advocate, mostly for my father, James. He suffers an acquired TBI, or beg your pardon, a severe TBI from an auto accident 28 months ago. He just turned 65 and I'm 36. I'm crying out for help here. I've ventured every single rabbit hole known to man. I've sought agency after agency, doctor after doctor, website after website. I listen to as many podcasts as I can. I've read almost everything there is to read online. I've read so many books and watched the very few documentaries that exist. What I need is, and she lists her needs, I need advocacy. I need advice, tips, tricks, support, more knowledge, help, guidance, even more knowledge, tools, trials, the best doctor in the world. I need to see other people my dad's age who have, who have a severe TBI and live like him. I need to know what doctor wants to take on and learn about the most complicated TBI patient ever. I have never seen or heard about anyone with a TBI that's close or similar to my dad's. I need there to be more information. I need people to see what it's like. I need resources and I need someone to have my back. Please help us. And she closes. I just need to know what people's experiences with medications are, what tools they're using. Is there a a way to help their loved ones who have aphasia be able to express themselves where caregivers and nurses can understand. How can I help him remember where he is and why he's here? Is there a device or a communication that can help? How do I keep him from being bored? And how do I slow down his thoughts and his worry and his fear? Now, I want to ask you, imagine for a minute, I want you to put yourself in Bethany's shoes. And I want to ask you, maybe more importantly, I want to ask you to put yourself in her dad's shoes. And I want you to imagine that maybe you don't have a Bethany. 
And I want you to imagine that you're going through everything that she's just described when those around you are either telling you that you just need to get used to it, they're accusing you of maybe faking it, and they don't believe you. I want you to imagine what that challenge would be like. And the reason I tell you Bethany's story is because it's uh, what we in the brain injury community know is that brain injury, it isn't just an event. It's something that is the start of something that is often misdiagnosed or misunderstood. And unfortunately, the reason I ask you the question about putting yourself in both Bethany and her father's shoes is because that is the experience of all too many people who have brain injury. And yet the public, uh, the public perception and arguably, I guess I would say our healthcare system, the belief is more that brain injury is an acute event. It's, it's maybe more like uh, breaking a leg, right? We tend to think of it as uh, you get a cast, you go get a little bit of PT, you spend some time resting up, it heals, it gets better, and you're on your way, right? What we actually know is that it's not like that at all. And what you can see on the screen is that brain injury uh, is actually a what we would consider many times, for many people, a chronic condition. And you can see a bar graph that's on the right there. So when you look at the data, I think the thing that you should look at when you see this is that um, focus on the same column. 22% stayed the same. Look at the fact that you had 26% improved and you had 30% became worse. So for 56% of the population in this particular study, which by the way, is from the TBI model systems, it's a collection of 16 uh, centers around the country, which arguably when it comes to brain injury are a national treasure with some of the longest longitudinal data sets that exist on people with brain injury. And this was a study, a five-year study of outcomes, as it says, uh, for individuals uh, post uh, rehab. So you can see that it was anything but static. It was anything but like a broken leg. And so you might look at the became worse column and, and you might be thinking, well, what, what happened to those folks? And there's, it further underscores when you drill into it, what we're saying here about brain injury being a chronic condition and not static. And when you look at the folks who got worse, there's a lot of reasons why they might've gotten worse. They got worse because of the risk for degenerative processes, or they might have had reduced activity levels and it produced comorbidities, or they had financial burdens and couldn't get the help that they needed, which, which actually uh, made their condition worse. So what I want you to hopefully take away from, from looking at this, if you were thinking about brain injury, you're thinking about concussion, and you're thinking, yeah, we well, just rest up, you look fine, and you get on your way. It is not that way at all, and the data certainly supports that. And that's why at the Brain Injury Association, we are focused on elevating recognition of brain injury as a chronic condition in partnership with our friends like the American Brain Coalition or the Congressional Neuroscience Caucus, or I would say the Congressional Brain Injury Task Force, which I hope you have heard from and would certainly um, consider joining. But Beth's story, which I shared with you just a few moments ago, illustrates for you what, again, the, ex the lived experience of, of those who never saw a brain injury coming in their life. They didn't wake up and expect to see this happening to them or their, their loved ones. And it illustrates what it's like. You can imagine what it would be like to, to navigate uh, on your own. But I want to tell you about the story of Angela McConnell, who further illustrates you know, this experience that brain injury isn't a single acute event. Angela, who's from Florida, uh, indicates that the most common myth that she's encountered about brain injury is that once the initial injury heals, everything returns to normal. People think that injuries are temporary setbacks rather than lifelong conditions that require ongoing management. And the misperception leads to the, it often overlooks, I should say, the persistent, uh, the persistence and often invisible challenges that people with TBI face every day related to cognitive deficits, memory problems, and sensory issues. So I hope in the few moments that I've had with you, that if you, as if, uh, Jeff alluded earlier, if you're one of the individuals who knows someone or perhaps it had sustained a heaven forbid, a concussion uh, yourself, uh, if there was uh, you know, any belief that this is something that is an acute event and, and you just simply go and get better, for some folks that does happen, certainly. We'll certainly want to acknowledge that. But I hope that you're taking away that for many folks, that doesn't happen. And so to really sort of put it in perspective, our issues, if I were able to summarize, is what I've talked about so far, that we have a gap in awareness and that, again, people think, uh, think of brain injury as this one-time event. 
We also, in our, in our country, we have a focus on the acute. And so whether that is our healthcare system or insurance system, it's primarily focused on the point of injury. And as you heard Jeff say earlier, that we have a funding issue as well, that we can extrapolate, we can look at what we know to be true about the incidence of brain injury. We can say it is far bigger than what is currently being funded uh, or what we know the prevalence of brain injury to be. So our issues are around awareness, the focus on the acute and the scale of the issue. And if I could be so bold, then what we need with respect to those issues is we need to increase awareness. And so for those of you who are here on the call, as I alluded earlier, uh, we are here in partnership with our friends. I hope uh, that your bosses, that you will take back to them to consider joining the Congressional Brain Injury Task Force and or the Congressional Neuroscience Caucus, if you're not already a part of that, and that's why you're here today. But when it comes to public health resources, I will also add my underscore to the Injury Center and to the CDC and why it's vital, completely underfunded. Uh, if you look at the National Concussion Surveillance System, which is uh, you know, an, an, an initial investment, I might say, to be able to under, better understand the prevalence of brain injury in, in our country, they're currently receiving $1.5 million, a million and a half dollars a year um, to be able to uh, address the scope and the size of the cause that we've been talking about here. And what we know from the initial pilot, from the million and a half dollars that the CDC has received from for the National Concussion Surveillance System, we know based on that data that uh, the incidence rate is 30 times uh, more. It's underreported by 30 times in adults when it comes to concussion and 17 times uh, in children. So we know we have enough information to extrapolate that it's far bigger than what we realize, but we need more funding to be able to put more numbers to that and to be able to understand the long-term impact. And then lastly, what we need is expanded private insurance benefits and supports, particularly in Medicare and Medicaid. And so I realize that's a very large issue that time doesn't allow us to go into. I would say that I want to acknowledge certainly that uh, as recently as June, that CMS has added traumatic brain injury as one of the chronic conditions uh, that is on their chronic condition list on the Medicare Advantage side. That certainly um, is a, a big step forward. We need to make that translate into real care and increased access uh, for survivors and their families. But I would also say, if there is another takeaway, uh, is that you consider supporting, you have your boss's support, uh, reauthorization of the TBI Act, which will be coming to both the, the House and the Senate floor for a full vote in the not too distant future. So certainly encourage you to be a part of that. So as I wrap this up, <clears throat> I wanted just to bring to you one last story, which is actually from Paige Melton Ivy, who happens to also be the, the, uh, the board chair for the Brain Injury Association of America. And as a caregiver, her husband suffered an anoxic brain injury from a deprivation of oxygen from a stroke. Uh, and as her caregiver, she really has highlighted for us, you know, this, this issue of focusing on the acute and what happens after that. Are, are individuals with, with brain injury being supported with therapy? You've heard Jeff talk about how many go on to therapy and the challenges related there but also residential options and making sure that there are resources and, and providing continuing support, and whether that is from insurance or community resources, there is a long road after the initial acute event. And we have to remember that. But I, I highlight Paige's example because what you would not know, what she gave me permission to share with you is that in her family, she has others with chronic conditions. They have an asthmatic in their family. They have a type one diabetic. And no one questions the chronic nature of those of, of those disease states. The individuals in her family, they get the meds that they need. They her type one diabetic, they get their insulin. But the one who is arguably the most disabled, her husband who suffered the anoxic brain injury, who needs the longest term care, has to continue to fight to be heard and to be recognized for, as having uh, a chronic condition in his brain injury. So I'll leave you with this photo. This is the uh, Brain Injury Community uh, for Brain Injury Awareness Day on Capitol Hill. <clears throat> I want you to, to know that the brain injury community does have a powerful voice. They are not always able to use it individually for themselves. And that's why we're here today and, and why the Brain Injury Association of America does what it does. We will be back on Capitol Hill on Wednesday, March the 5th uh, next year. So I hope that you will be on the lookout for, uh, for all of our folks wearing blue proudly and uh, calling on your offices. So thank you for being a part of today. And I'll certainly, Jeff, uh, pass the baton back over to you.